So it's broadcast. Is it being broadcast now, Maureen? Okay. Uh, welcome to the meeting of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, General Laws Chapter 30A, Section 18, and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This public meeting of the town of Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but the public can listen to the proceedings by clicking on the link on the town's webpage. As with any public meeting, we do have a period of um, public comment at the end of the meeting. And we will, of course, make that available uh, as we always do for the public. And we will describe at the end of the business that we go through today, um, how the public can um, comment at that time. Um, tonight's one of the, um, the zoning board is a quasi judicial body that operates under the authority of chapter 48 of the general laws of the Commonwealth for the purposes of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. Tonight's agenda is a training session for our new members, and, um, and, and that will be our sole order of business for the evening. Um, and before we begin, I just want to make ask everybody to mute themselves until you're going to um, speak, and then you can use the, um, the your mouse to unmute yourself, speak, and then um, please put yourself back on mute. It just makes it easier for a large number of participants to uh, to in a Zoom meeting if we all are muted, if we're not intending to speak. Tonight's training session um, will be conducted principally by staff, but I just wanted to say a couple of things to open the meeting. And the first is thank you for attending, and more importantly, thank you for agreeing to serve on the Zoning Board of Appeals. Tonight's training session was, as I said, is principally going to be conducted by the staff. And we are really fortunate to have the support of a dedicated and highly skilled staff at the town that really makes our job much easier. Maureen Pollock is our principal liaison. Christine Brestup is the planning director. They both do, an, and Rob Mora also works with us. We do, they do an excellent job. They make our, our job a lot easier. And quite frankly, I don't think we could do this without their help. So most, they're gonna conduct the briefing, um, and I'm, and, but I just have a couple things to say. I would just like to mention a few things at the start. The first of which is, I think it's important to remember that the Zoning Board of Appeals for many town people and for many of our neighbors is the most important and most impactful interaction they're gonna have with their government. When you think about it, they're gonna deal, it deals with the value of their house, their property, the quality of life in their neighborhood. Maybe it's dealing with the value of their business or the, the future of their business. Whatever it is, it, it affects them on a day-to-day -day basis. This is really an important body, important board. And for many people, this is the one the most impactful time they deal with the town government. So in that regard, I think it's really important that whenever we act, we do so in a way that creates the impression of a fair and competent town government. And I wanna make sure that each person that does business with, this, with the ZBA feels they were treated fairly, and that they were, that the rules were followed and the process was fair. And I also wanna make sure that each one of you feels that you have the opportunity to contribute equally and fairly to our deliberations and that your voice will be heard. And I commit to try to do that as best I can as chair. I've enjoyed my time on the ZBA. I've learned a lot, but most importantly, I've learned that there's a lot more that I have left to learn and I rely upon the staff and, and all of you to help with that. But most importantly, I know that we are doing something that's really beneficial to the town and that our town and our neighbors benefit from what we're doing and that what we do is very important. So I look forward to working with you and trying to keep this and, and trying to maintain the ZBA as an important, fair and impactful board for the, for the community. And I look forward to working with all of you. And with that, I'd just like to turn it over to Maureen and to Chris to, to brief our new members. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, I wanted to uh, welcome Dave Waskevitz, who's joining us. He's the lead building inspector. Um, and Dave. so whenever Rob is unavailable, uh, Dave is my 
my go-to uh, for um, building code and uh, and zoning code uh, uh, interpretations, as well as Chris Brestrup, the planning director. So uh, hopefully everyone received the binder of information um, that I left at each um, new member's uh, door. As I did it, I I hope that I got each person's correct address. So um, so uh, that will be a good binder to keep. Um, there wasn't a you know there it it was a good amount of information to um, to have from the get go. Um, and as uh, periodically we'll have new information and you could add to that binder. So I hope that that will be a living do document that you can refer to as uh, new types of um, cases or, or uh, building code uh, matters come up, um, we can give you handouts and you can include them. So I, um, unless Chris has um, anything to mention, I was gonna start with the, the special permit uh, guidance document as a, sort of a, a guiding tool for this presentation. And feel free, I would like to make this more of a conversation than giving um, like a lecture or instructional um, speech. So well, I don't have any introduction to make, but I would like to welcome everybody and um, thank Maureen for putting this together and thank Steve Judge for agreeing to be the chair of the zoning board, which is a, a weighty responsibility. So thank you both. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, I really um, wanted just to go through, you know, the ZBA is a quasi judicial body that operates under Chapter 40A of the General Laws of Massachusetts. Uh, you can certainly um, Google that, Chapter 40A. I debated whether to put that in your binder, but I didn't want to overwhelm everyone with more materials. Um, so the purpose of uh, Chapter 40A is to promote the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the residents of Amherst. Um, Section 10.38, which is in the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, also outlines that process and the, uh, the specific findings that must be made for all ZBA uh, special permit decisions. Uh, and so with that note, I'll just say for the majority of time, uh, the ZBA handles special permits, uh, which would be uses that are allowed by special permit or uh, dimensional regulations that require a special permit. Um, occasionally, and when I say occasionally, maybe one to three times per year, the, uh, the ZBA will handle a variance. Uh, I've been in Amherst for two years and now we're handling a, or we're, we most likely will be handling a comprehensive permit application. That happens, who knows, one every few years, uh, or may, maybe even every five or 10 years, uh, depending on the community. Um, there's another application that the, that the ZBA handles uh, a time from time, maybe once or twice a year, which is, uh, a property owner gets a building is requesting a building permit from the building commissioner and the applicant doesn't get what they were hoping for maybe they were denied by the bu building commissioner so the applicant slash property owner has the right to appeal the building commissioner's decision to the zba so um those are the various permit uh, permits that go through um, the ZBA. So primarily it's special permits. And so this guidance document is uh, specifically geared to special permits. So um, all meetings and public hearings of the ZBA are open to the public. Just as this meeting is open to the public, um, there was an agenda that was posted um, in the local paper um, there was uh, an, the agenda posted on the town website and uh, in various places. So for public hearings, so for a special permit, that requires a public hearing notification. And for that, that um, all public hearings need to be advertised in the Daily Hampshire Gazette twice, two weeks before the hearing and one week before the hearing. And um, the abutters that reside 300 feet from that project site 
um, they get notified by regular mail about the time, the date, and the location of of the public hearing, and then what what is the um, what is the specific request? What is the applicant requesting? Um, and then the note that's in the uh, legal ad and in the abutter notice has a, a sentence saying, for more information, um, please contact the planner at, and then list my email. Um, and when the town hall is open, and so unfortunately town hall is not open, there's usually a line that says, the plans may be um, looked at at town hall. So for right now, people need to email me directly and then I can email them um, any information that they are requesting regarding uh, um, an application. So a special permit is a discretionary land use approval that a landowner or and or the applicant is required to obtain prior to uh, undertaking certain activities of their home of their property. Uh, the table of use uh, regulations or the listed permitted uses located in the zoning bylaw indicates what activities require a special permit. So when um, you take a look through the, the zoning bylaw, the copy that I gave you, you go to section 3.3 and that lists all the uses that are allowed by right, by special permit, by the either the ZBA or the planning board, allowed by site plan review by the planning board, or not allowed at all. And um, so those would be those examples. And those are, um, and so you can refer to that um, at your leisure. So as a discretionary land use approval, the request for a special permit may be denied by the ZBA for projects that the ZBA anticipates will adversely impact the community. Alternatively, the ZBA may approve a request for a special permit subject to conditions and limitations to prevent or mitigate potential adverse impacts of the proposed project. And so for the most part, uh, or for 99% of the time, whenever the board approves a special permit, uh, they, will, they will include conditions as part of the special permit that will help mitigate any potential adverse impacts. For example, let's say there's a new house going that needs um, a, a, a property owner wants to put in a duplex and there's you know houses all uh, on all sides of, of this property and the neighbors while they may say oh you know I have nothing against the duplex I have nothing against these people we're you know we're supportive but we don't want to look at their house we want to maintain our privacy. We want um, to, yeah, to have our privacy. And so during the public hearing, um, the board will, will take note of a butter's comments such as that, and they will help guide make conditions. So um, a typical condition by the ZBA would um, after talking to the applicant would be, would you be agreeable of putting maybe arborvitaes or, or a, a fence to provide to maintain a um, privacy between the two um, properties. So um, the conditions help mitigate any potential adverse impacts whenever possible. Uh, and that's just a, a very basic example of that. Um, so the Amherst uh, zoning bylaw includes findings found under section 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, which uh, evaluates whether the uh, proposed activity requires a special permit will have ad adverse impacts. And so 10.38 really goes through all kinds of areas of, you know, what will do to views, what will happen to open space. Is it connected or is it uh, connected to um, the town infrastructure such as water, sewer, um, uh, chime in, uh, and then there's all kinds, and what's the, you know, is there gonna be safe circulation uh, for pedestrians and motorists? Um, so 10.38 has uh, all these very specific findings that the board has to go through, which they do before they close any uh, public hearing and make their decision. Um, and uh, so that would be important for you guys to, at your leisure, go through and just read through to see, you know, the types of um, findings I'm talking about. 
So can I just jump in for oh, a minute? Oh, sure. Yes, please. Just to say that not all the findings are applicable to every project. Yes. And sometimes you don't even need to go through the 10.38 findings if you're looking at something purely from the standpoint of being a non-conforming uh, use or st structure or whatever. And then you look to section 9.22 of the zoning bylaw to make your findings. But most of the time, Maureen is right, you do have to go through all of the individual findings of um, section 10.38. So it's a good idea to become uh, familiar with that. Yes, thank you. And please, Dave, Chris, whomever, um, if you have uh, things to add or you have a question, please uh, feel free to um, speak up. So I, I want this to be a conversation than, than me just rambling on. This is Keith. Oh, uh, hi Keith. I think it might be important just to say that in the 10.38, as we go through them for each thing, there are at times uh, uh, sections that are not applicable. Mm -hmm. And we just say that, you know, so that uh, there are sometimes uh, what we're going through is much more simple. Uh, and so there are just sections like uh, floodplains where <laughs> given a certain thing, it's just not applicable. And we just say that and move on. So I just wanted to. Throw Thank that. you. Yes. Very good point. Um, so the uh, content and form of an application for a special permit are dictated by the zoning bylaw and the ZBA rules and regulations. Um, one thing I wish I included in your binder was a copy of the special permit application. Um, I will email that to everyone. It is on the town website on, on the ZBA webpage. Um, I think that will be good for you guys just to go through to really understand what is uh, required of the applicants. Uh, so I, I apologize for not including that. Can I say one more thing? Yes which is that um, Maureen provides the ZBA members who are on the panel with a really thorough report. It's called the Project Application Report. And it goes through all of these things, 10.38 and whatever other sections of the bylaw are applicable. So you don't have to, you can if you want to, but you don't have to thumb through the zoning bylaw every time you get an application and try to figure out what is applicable and what isn't. Maureen will give you guidance on that. Yes, yes. Correct. And I also will provide, and I have Chris uh, often review the project application report and we'll talk about um, what possible conditions would make sense for that specific uh, project. So as Chris said, I do write a report. I do give a review of how the proposed application meets or doesn't meet the sections that they are asking approval of, and I will um, make responses to 10, uh, section 10.38 findings. And then I also include um, suggested conditions for you to consider as you um, go through your deliberation. And during, the pub and during that deliberation, you as members will most likely create uh, conditions of yourselves to be considered and that would be something that you would discuss my, the possible conditions that I include and discuss the ones that you uh, propose and then you would decide uh, on that as you make your motion to approve or deny a project okay I have a question sure can I have a quick can I ask a question oh sure I, yep yep so uh, when you say 10.38, I was expecting 10.38 and then a bunch of stuff under 10.38, but it looks to me like it goes 10.39 and 10 point, is that part of 10.38? Uh, let me just pull up 10.38. Just, it looks like it runs all the way to 10.398. Yeah, yeah, so, yep, so 10.38, uh, it says if you go to that specific findings required. So that's a section or a subsection. And so that would be 10.3802 to, if you turn the next page, to 10.398. Yeah. Yes. So it's not just one um, sentence. It's, it's um, a whole bunch of um, subsections of 10.38 if that makes sense. Okay, great, great question. 
you know, Maureen, I would add one thing. One of the things that that um, is, that you provide is, and that that the applicant provides is um, a management plan. And are you going to talk about what's contained in the ma in the in a management plan on the uh, sure. on the application? Uh, yeah, uh, we could. If you, you guys don't have to do it now, I just you yeah, don't have to do it you know, now. But if you, if sure, you are going to do it, I won't. I won't. Uh, I won't talk sure. about it now. You know what I will do? Um, whenever it makes sense, I will share my screen and show you the special permit application, and we can just quickly go through each of the pages, which includes the management plan. Great. Okay, uh, so the special permit rules and regs are adopted or amended by majority vote of the ZBA, which we may be doing next Thursday um, at that meeting. Uh, the ZBA rules and regs may include application requirements, a fee schedule, procedures for review, special permit review requirements, and uh, various other um, sections. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the ZBA is encouraged to regularly evaluate and amend their rules and regulations so the review process happens smoothly and efficient, efficiently. So we're doing good. Next week, we're going to be reviewing it um, as we should. Uh, I think probably an, on an annual basis, it's healthy for the ZBA to review their rules and regs and see um, what changes, if any, are needed. Okay, so so, um, so, so submitting, so an applicant wants to submit a application to the planning department. Um, perhaps maybe this is a good time to show the application. So let me pull that up. Bear with me. Uh, application. Share. Share screen. Okay, can everyone see this? Yep. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay, you did. Okay. I got it. Um, okay, share screen. Okay, it's right here. Sorry. It's the ZBA application. Okay. So an applicant wants to submit an application to the ZBA. This is the application itself. The first page is pretty, you know, generic. They list their name, the address, uh, their, per, you know, their personal information over here is the address of the project site. Um, the applicant can actually be different than the property owner. So the property owner could be, let's say, the, you know, let retail is an easy one, uh, maybe one of the buildings downtown. So maybe it's owned by Barry Roberts, for instance, and the applicant over here is um, is Antonio's Pizza. So that would be a good example. Um, and then they would list if they have a designer or attorney or whoever is assisting with their project. Here, uh, type of application, they would click off, uh, check off, you know, if it's a special permit, comprehensive permit. Uh, appealed from decision of the building commissioner or a variance. And over here, they would list um, their map and parcel um, that's associated with the property and then the zoning district. And then here they would type in the um, applicable zoning sections that they're making their request. They would sign it um, and it needs to be signed by the building commissioner. And he does that once him and I have sat down, looked at it and confirmed everything that they were supposed to submit, did they actually submit it? So we need to make sure it's complete um, before we file it with the town clerk. And once it's filed with the town clerk, then there's a um, sort of clock that starts. And so the board has to open the public hearing within 65 days of that date. So one thing is um, before the applicant submits this form and all the backup documents, the applicant usually has a meeting with Maureen and the building commissioner and maybe other people in our office to um, help us to understand what it is they're trying to do and help them to understand um, all the different permits that they need, including what sections of the zoning bylaw might apply to their particular project. Yes, very good point. Sometimes people um, 
have uh, a, a great, you know, a project in mind and then they come in and we either say, oh, well, unfortunately that's not allowed in that zoning district or you need to um, apply for all these other permits. Like there's wetlands, they would have to go through the conserv conservation commission if they're within a um, hundred feet of the wetland or um, we help, help, help guide them in, through their permit process. And so on the second page, uh, this top part is called uh, nature request and brief description of the project. Um, so here they would just describe what they're requesting and with any of these fields, if they need more room, I always tell them, oh, just say see attached and they can do it in a Word document. So here it could be, let's say, um, it's an owner occupied duplex and now they actually would like to make it a non-owner occupied duplex. So they could type that. I currently live at, I currently live and own at this duplex. I would actually like to move out of this duplex and now make it a non-owner occupied duplex. So they would say that. Um, waivers, um, waivers that are requested from the special permit application. Um, I'm gonna uh, stop, uh, stop there and return to that. So the following is a checklist of all this, of uh, the checklist for the ZBA application process. So of course they have to submit an, an application. Uh, they have to submit a certified list of, of butters uh, to the planning department. And so we create uh, through the assessor's office, a certified of butters that that are of the properties that were within 300 feet of that project property. And so those are the individuals that get mailed by, get a mail a butters list uh, by regular mail. Um, I had mentioned this earlier. And this is the way that they are informed that there is a public hearing for a, 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 a special permit or a comprehensive permit or a variance or whatever it is. And it tells them all the information about the meeting and how they can acquire more about the, the, app, the application. The next uh, bullet is fees. So um, the fees are listed on one of the pages here and they have to include a check. We get a hard copy and an electronic copy of everything. Um, and in this whole uh, virtual world, uh, the electronic copy is very, very extra important. Um, so here are the, uh, the following is supplemental materials as part of the application, which include uh, a site plan. Um, and these are all the things that would need to be listed or uh, shown on the site plan. Um, you know, name of the property no owner, um, or the and the um, person that created the plan, a title block, a date, and a scale of the plan. They would have to provide the lot lines if there was any easements or right of ways, um, the size of the property in square feet, show all the setbacks, that the front setback, the side setback, the rear setback, uh, and they would refer to the bylaw to help, um, the applicant would refer to the, um, the, the bylaw to figure that out. Um, the location, and use of all the existing and proposed buildings and structures. They would um, want to show the dimensions and heights of that. Uh, they would want to show um, where there are streets and curb cuts and entrances and exits and the parking areas and sidewalks and, and items like that. They would want to show existing and proposed contours um, of the property. Uh, they would want to show all the natural features such as, you know, wetlands and trees. Um, sometimes pro projects include removal of trees. So we will uh, often require that they show on the plan which tr specific trees will be removed and we'll ask them to, to uh, call out the, the species of that tree and the size of that tree. Um, specifically because at times, sometimes we'll uh, require that they, as a condition, replace a tree or trees, several trees, or maybe all the trees. It's part of the conversation when the public hearing is held. Um, container, uh, and then they show um, all sorts of things, locations of, you know, recycling and dumpsters and things like that, uh, showing parking spaces and then showing um, the calculated building and lot coverage 
for the, the property. Um, then uh, building plans, um, they would have to show an elevation um, of like the building of the seeing the building. Um, and th they would have to show the dimensions of that. They would have to provide floor plans and then management plan, that's the next one. And this is what Steve had um, had mentioned earlier. I'll just jump to that. So the management plan is listed here. And this is uh, really um, to show how uh, it's for the applicant to explain um, how they're gonna manage their property. So they'll talk about trash, who's picking up the trash. Is it Amherst trucking? Um, is it being picked up once once a week or every two weeks. Uh, this would just describe the parking situation, how many parking spots are there, um, et cetera. This will explain the types of uh, exterior light fixtures, how many, what type, is it downcast and shielded, all, also known as dark sky compliant. This one uh, would be signage. Um, if it's like retail, for example, or a restaurant, um, they would describe, you know, if, are they having a building wall or a marquee sign and what, what's the size, what's the color, what's the material, um, things like that will be illuminated. So they would want to provide as much detail about that and provide um, a visual of what these sorts of things would look like, but they would describe them here. Uh, you know, landscape maintenance, who's, you know, mowing the lawn, is it a company, how often, um, is there like a fall and spring cleanup, who, who's responsible for that, and then like snow removal, um, the often applicants would list, you know, maybe the property owner shovels, or maybe they have a, um, a, um, a contractor um, plow after every snowstorm. And then this, this is additional information for specific project types. So we have additional information for restaurants, for um, required for permit renewals, um, if like a permit expired and they have to renew it, um, this would come in um, into play. Additional information requir required for apartments and additional information required for home occupants. So, Maureen, can I just say one thing quickly? Oh, sure, yes. One of the, the reasons that I brought this up is that many of the things dealt with in the management plan are important for mitigating effects on the neighborhood. And it's some of the things that at a public hearing people will um, discuss um, and can be addressed, or they'll state a concern and can be addressed in the, the uh, applicant's management plan. And it's not the only place where that's done. Sometimes that's done with conditions but one of the ways in which the management plan helps to deal with um, the effects on the neighborhood or, or the effects on the town is, is through this management plan. Yes, thank you so much for pointing that out. Um, let's see here, so I'm gonna scroll back. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we were at the management can, plan. Can I ask a question, Maureen? Yes, yep. Yeah. Uh, before the hearing, do does the board know what kinds of problems a butters might have with the plan or do oh. you find or do you find that out at the meeting uh good question sometimes both or sometimes one or the other uh so again the abutters are notified by regular mail and uh and then my email and phone number are listed and so sometimes i will receive emails or a letter in the mail addressed to the ZBA and it'll be like a letter of support or a letter of concern or, you know, a letter completely opposing a project. And so I'll gather all those together and I will um, scan them and I will e uh, either email them to you or I'll um, mail them to you. So what happens is, and then, so that's one scenario. And then sometimes, people hold off and they just plan to come to the meeting and, and they rather just uh, state their opinions at the meeting. So it's kind of, it's up to how they feel like going about it. So um, I just want to say one thing about that. So in this virtual world that we're currently in, we provide people with um, an address, what we call a Zoom address, where they can access the meeting. And at the appropriate time, if they do have comments, 
they can raise their hand to be recognized and then either Steve or Maureen can recognize them and they can um, speak their piece even in the virtual world. We've tried really hard to make this um, type of meeting as close to the regular meeting as possible and we don't want people to feel like they're excluded from the meetings. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. And so th these are the materials that I receive when they submit their application to the town hall. We re I review it. I then actually forward all the application in the, the supportive materials to all town staff for their opportun opportunity to provide comments. So such as the, the fire department, the police department, the building department, uh, DPW, planning staff, um, the health department, and like the town manager's office. Um, there, it's a whole roster of, of people. And I will tell them in my email, please review, here's the application, please review and provide comments about a week before the meeting. Um, so then I can include in my uh, what's called the board packet for you. And so for each of these applications, I will print out everything that they submitted. I'll print out the project application report that I typed up and I'll print out um, town, town staff comments and all um, comments that I've received from the public uh, to date. And then I will uh, either mail or hand deliver <laughs> Traditionally, I just mail these things. So, um, and then I'll mail them to you. And then I also will email you uh, electronic copy to everything. And um, I, and unfortunately, I I do get things uh, updated, things from the applicant, maybe last minute comments from different uh, town departments um, because uh, you know they were on vacation or, or something like that or last minute public comments I'll get those sort of at the last minute so sometimes I am emailing the board you know that day of the meeting of oh here's a last minute you know document that you need and so when we do have meetings at town hall I will print those out and leave them at your seats in our new virtual world, I'll just have to email you those sort of last minute things and hope that um, the applicants and and everyone is able to provide us uh, materials uh, about a week before the meeting. Um, so if the board does receive something at the last minute and doesn't feel like um, the board members have time to review the material, you can say that to the applicant. We didn't have time to review this material, so we need to continue the public hearing to another date. So we'll hear from you tonight, but then for this particular piece of material, we need time to review it. So we're gonna continue the public hearing. Yeah, that's a really good point. And actually that is stated in the ZBA rules and regulations. So, you know, sometimes often it's these little things of a, uh, that are handed in at the last minute, which is, it's annoying, but it's, it's acceptable. Like you, you guys can read a, a last minute email from, you know, uh, butter, but you know, we, we really don't want to get substantial material at the last minute and not have enough time to review anything. So that, that's very good advice, Chris. So yeah, that's, that is one of my pet peeves is as chairman, I'm going to make sure that we're not deluged with last minute information and significant, substantial changes to applications. It happened a couple of times and you, the pressure, you get pressure on, you feel a pressure, you shouldn't, but you do feel a pressure to try to go through it all and, and uh, decide at that meeting on the application. But um, Christine is right. We can always say we, we need more time to look at this um, but I think an admonition to all applicants that they should have the um, material to us a week ahead of time so it can be distributed and we have time to look at it is important. And it's something that I will, um, I really feel strongly about. And I will try to guide this, the board to, to um, give us all time to do that, uh, to do the, the reading that we have to do to um, be up to date, up to speed on the, the application. Mm -hmm. so I just want to add one thing to that, which is that um, staff doesn't really like to be the gatekeeper in terms of those last minute things. 
Um, so we will forward anything that we get, mm -hmm. you know, even up to the last minute. Um, and then it's up to the board members to determine whether they want to um, take it under consideration that night or not, because we don't feel like we are in a position to withhold information from you that we have received. That's a good point. Yeah, that is a good point. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Maureen? Yes. Um, I don't know if, I don't know exactly what all you have are yet to say, but I think it might be good for those of us who are new on the board for Steve, if you would, to go through that opening statement and a short discussion about the process of the meeting itself. Oh, it's a good idea. Do, do you want me to do that? Maureen, whenever, that whenever, whenever you want to do that, I'm just throwing uh, Let me just stop, finish here because I'm almost done. Um, and so other sorts of things that uh, applicants can submit is a landscaping plan, a lighting plan, a sign plan. Um, and so getting back to this page up here, waivers to be requested, that's in reference to this checklist. So occasionally, you know, let's just pretend there's a playground being proposed. I don't know if that would ever need a special permit. Um, and they will never have, or the dog park, there's a proposed dog park in town. I don't, th I, which didn't need a special permit. I'm just making this up. But um, the dog park won't be lit. It'll just be open during the day. They would request a waiver from the lighting plan because there is no lighting being proposed. So that would be a, a good example of that. And then the application, itself lists uh, section 10.38, so the applicant can actually go through and provide responses to all of these. Um, and it's a friendly reminder that they need to go through those. And then this page is, uh, goes through the fees, the management plan, and I think that's it. And then this is the butters list form and, and that's it. So I'm going to stop share. Okay, we're back. Um, Steve, do you have the? Um, I do. I okay. have. You don't have to read the whole thing, or you could just do yeah. the gist. I've, I've got the whole thing here, and this is um, the, the introduction for the board meetings and board hearings um, is a is, is a formulaic thing that makes a lot of sense and to to read through because it lays out the process by which the the meetings and the hearings are conducted. So if I go through this, I can um, sort of notate as, as we go along some important aspects. Um, as, as Maureen said, the Zoning Board is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 48 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general wealth for the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaws is 10.38. Um, specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions, including the finding that that section is not applicable. But we have to make that is we, though that section is um, defines how we how we may uh, decide on a special permit or make any any decision. We have to justify that by making the decisions, uh, making the determinations under required under ten point three eight. All hearings and meetings are open to the public, including this one, and they're recorded by town staff. And the procedure of these meetings is as follows. And it's important we have both a meeting and a hearing. They're two separate um, gatherings of the board or, or convocations of the board. The, meet, the, the petitioner presents the application to the board during a hearing, after which the board asks, so we, first you have the petitioner say, here's what I would like to do. At that point, the board then can ask questions. The chair will recognize each of the, uh, the board members for those questions. The applicant then addresses his response, his or her response back to the board. After the board has completed their questions, the board will seek public input and the public speaks with the permission of the chair. And in, in the hearing, there's time, there's specific, um, there's specific uh, time for this and it's now. When you are recognized, you ask them to give their name, give the and their address to the board for the record, and all questions and comments have to be addressed to the board. We don't want them addressed to cross, uh, you know, to each other or, or or to the audience or to other 
the applicants to um, petitioners uh, or 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 uh, abutters. It's best that all comments are addressed to the board. So the board will normally hold a public hearing where information about the project and the input from the public is gathered. And so we'll conduct that. The the uh, public question the public will have uh, a chance to ask their questions or make their points. We then will say to the applicant, um, ask them to respond to the public's points, not, not uh, at each time the person speaks, but in total that they respond to the, pub, to the public comments. And that's another time, and then after that's done, time for us to ask some more questions that we're probably, that we may have um, considered or maybe may raised in our mind because of the comments from the public. So we'll have another chance to, as a board, to ask questions of the applicant. At that point, we're done with the public hearing portion of the meeting. We close the public hearing and we open a public meeting section. The public meeting is not normally the time when the public speaks. That's an opportunity for the board to discuss amongst ourselves with the input of the applicant, should we need it, for um, whether how we want to deal and, and dispose of the application before us. If the board feels it has enough time and information, it can decide upon the application that night. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and is evaluated, evaluated on its own merits. And the board is not ruled by precedent. And then the, the opening has a, um, delineates each of the time frames for how long it will take to for the special permit to um, be filed how long it, how long for the for the from the date of filing for it to go into effect we don't have to go through all that stuff tonight that's all handled by the staff uh, very efficiently but what's important is that we have to, to decide we have to have a public hearing which brings in the public's comment and then we have a public meeting of which we decide we, we have a discussion and at the end of that public meeting we just we take a vote as to whether number we go through the 10.38 we, we we go through the various um conditions that we think we may want to have we have a discussion about those and then we vote on whether to approve the motion uh, approve the application we decide whether there's conditions we want to apply to that and we decide um and we make a determination that we have um, gone through the 10.38 requirements and then the vote is on the motion to approve the application or the petition. And um, that's then the process of filing it takes place when the staff does that. So that's, uh, Keith, I think that's what you wanted us to go through. Yeah, isn't it? yeah. can I just add a couple of things? One, please. Uh, when the uh, rules and regulations were written, it was a three member board. Now it's a five member board. So when there are five members sitting, the vote to uh, approve has to be four at least uh, four out of those five it can be all five but it has it can be four out of those five when there for whatever reason it happens every once in a while if there are only four members sitting it has to be unanimous okay yes yes the other thing is the other idea of a public meeting is that we may approve uh uh, an application, but say uh, you have to come back to us with uh, revised plans, but we don't want to hold you up by not approving this because we want to approve it, but we have to have those plans. So you have to come back to a public meeting. So a couple of Thursdays later or whenever, they come back with the revised plans and it's a public meeting. It's not a hearing. So there is no public input. It is purely for the board to receive the new information, say, okay, yeah, this is fine. It's de minimis. It's not a big change. We don't have to go back to a public meeting, uh, public hearing to right. debate this new change. Uh, and then we can say, okay, fine. And, and we approve it. That's, that's, that can happen before, that can happen uh, on an evening when we have public hearings. Normally the public meeting will take place first and then we go to the normal, which is the public hearing. And then within that process is a public meeting, which Steve described. But 
uh, I just wanted to say that that can happen in a different way also, so that you're not confused yeah. by the term of public meeting. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to pull up. Yeah. Can, can I raise a question? I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this. So when you're in a public hearing, uh, members of the board can speak, the applicant can speak, uh, and anyone who comes to the hearing can speak, uh, uh, if recognized by the chair. When you're in a public meeting, uh, the same people may still be in the room, but only members of the board and the applicant can speak. Is that, do I have that right? Ordinarily, that's right, but at the discretion of the chair or the discretion of the board, we can allow uh, some public comments okay. at a public meeting, but it's usually not the case. Um, that's usually only if in, during a public hearing. Okay. So it would be the exceptional circumstance. Thank you. Can everyone see my screen? This yeah. is, a, uh, I just pulled up a random uh, old uh, ZBA agenda. Um, this is from February, and um, these um, here it's uh, public meetings. So that that's what Keith and Steve were referring to. Um, and so this applicant, Amherst Rental Properties LLC, they had received a special permit. Uh, I believe the board approved the special permit at the meeting prior but they had to um, make some uh, minor updates to their management plan, uh, layout plan, which is also known as a site plan, their landscaping plan and lighting plan pursuant, pursuant to conditions 19 and 20 of their special permit. So that, th that was the example of those conditions 19 and 20 most li stated the applicant shall return to the ZBA at a public meeting for the review and approval of an updated management plan, layout plan, landscaping plan, and lighting plan. Um, and so th that's a perfect example of, of a public meeting. So the applicant, um, so uh, another key difference between a public meeting and a public hearing is notification. So public meetings do not need to have a legal ad posted and the abutters do not need to be uh, abutters living within 300 feet of that project site do not need to be notified by regular mail. Um, uh, and that's under uh, Massachusetts general law. And then here's another example. And, uh, and um, this, um, so there's there aren't those requirements now here is a, a public hearing um and so these these go through the whole uh, public hearing process which includes the legal ad in the hampshire da get the daily gazette and the abutters are notified about those public hearings so i'd like to say something about um the public comment um at the discretion of the chair the chair can determine that um if there's a big room full of people he can say how many people would like to make comments and if he sees you know 25 hands he might say well you know why don't you choose someone who represents the group who can speak on the, on your behalf or he might say um, each person can have two minutes to speak um, so you don't want you know some of these meetings can really go on and on and it ends up with people repeating things that other people have said or repeating things they've said themselves so the chair has the um, prerogative to determine, um, you know, whether something has been said before, or you know, whether you really need to hear from 50 people for three minutes. You know, he, you may not want to do that because that's a lot of time. Um, and mm -hmm. if it looks like there are a lot of people who need to say something, you can ask them to submit something in writing, or you can continue the public hearing and have them come back another time. I know that the previous chair of the ZBA um, kind of set a, a rule. I don't know if it was written down anywhere, but um, you know he determined uh, for some meetings that he wasn't going to go past you know nine o'clock at night, um, and that's a reasonable thing to do because sometimes for big contentious projects the meetings can go till midnight, and you really don't want to do that because then your next day you're not going to feel good on your job or whatever it is you're doing. So you have the right to say, you know, no, we're going to cut off public comment at X time 
and come back in two weeks and we'll hear you then. So there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of discretion that the chair has to manage public comment. Good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, since I have the agenda listed up here, so now um, where I'm highlighting, so normally obviously we have our meetings in town hall um, this information now says go to the Zoom link or you you can call in to a Zoom meeting. So anyone that doesn't have a, a you know a laptop or a smartphone, they actually can just call from their um, landline at home and then there is a, a, a number um, when they call there's a prompt and then they can type in the meeting code. So uh, I'm glad that um, there's both options. And um, so these are the public meetings and public hearings listed for this meeting. And then here it says public comment period. And so all boards and committees in Amherst are required to have this listed on their agenda. And this is an opportunity for any member of the public to provide comment for items that do not include special uh, permit applications that are are, are before the ZBA. So for instance, they could not be, they couldn't be talking about this application. They couldn't, um, but if they had something else they wanted to bring up um, for the board to consider, um, we seldomly have, have received comments related to this, but we do offer that for the public. And then this item is other business not anticipated within, within 48 hours. Um, we don't often have uh, items under this, but not to say that we won't, maybe, it, I would say that it'd be more administrative than not. Uh, maybe we would say, oh, there's a conference being offered and here's some information that we would love for you all to attend. Um, and that, that's it for the uh, agenda. And so this agenda is posted on the ZBA webpage and it's also listed on the town calendar on the town website and these public hearings. Um, and it's also listed on the, uh, we have a digital bulletin board on the computer screen list, uh, located on the basement level of the town hall by the elevator. So we're not really, we're not utilizing that at the moment, but we're doing the best we can to um, get the word out about these meetings. And also there is a feature on the town website, um, which uh, let's see, can you guys see that I'm, t can you see uh, me switching this, the website? I'm on the town website. Yes. Um, I'm never good at this. So bear with me, if you go to search, Notify me, I just saw that. Notify me. So you'll be unfortunately getting emails from me probably more more times than you want. But, um, but this is f good information for residents in town that wanna keep up, up to date about ZBA applications. So they can be notified about uh, specific projects and they can be notified um, for uh, different boards. So whenever I update the meeting agenda on the website, they will get an email and it will notify them that there's a new agenda up. And so that's a good way for, for persons to just keep track of um, a particular you know, project uh, or projects they want to know more about and know about the meeting and time and stuff, so. Are you going to talk about the open meeting law, Maureen? Sure. Oh yeah, that's a good suggestion. Um, uh, but just to, I guess, continue with the special permit process. So once you guys make the decision, I type up the, the decision, the conditions, all that. And I um, then email it out to you and I ask if you have any, um, you know, edits to the decision, uh, please email me directly and which is a good, um, <laughs> which is a, a good, uh, what's the expression? Um, segue. 
segue to the open meaning law, but I'll get there. <laughs> so, you know, some people might say, oh, you forgot that condition or you forgot to say that. And I'll say, oh, thank you. Thank you for remembering. Or they'll see a spelling mistake and I'll say, oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. Um, and so we'll finalize it. And then I'll send you another email saying the special permit decision or whatever decision is ready for you to sign. And normally you would come into town hall and we have a, a specific location for you to sign. But in this virtual world, um, which we just did, I think yesterday, I had board members meet me in the parking lot behind town hall. Everyone brought their own pen and they sign the decisions. And then I file it with the town clerk and then there's um, there, and then the applicant has some following steps, um, which we don't need to get into at the moment, unless you want to hear them. But so good segue to the open meeting law. I said, you know, if you had any comments about the decision, um, email me directly and not include other members of the board on the email. So open meeting law, which is defined by, uh, you know, Massachusetts state law is that your meeting, um, Chris, do you want to explain this? Yeah, all the meetings of boards and committees are open to the public and we want to make sure that everybody has the same information. So um, board and committee members are only able to discuss topics that are coming before them in an open meeting. They can't have private email exchanges. They can't have discussions with one another um, in between meetings, either on the street or in the form of email. Um, so all of your deliberations and all of your comments and conversations about things that are coming before you need to happen in, in an open meeting. So if you have um, questions or comments, you can, um, if you have questions in particular, you can direct them to staff, either to Maureen or to Rob Mora, the building commissioner, or to me, and we can answer your questions. Um, and then if you have things that you want to bring up about a particular project, you have to um, present those comments or concerns or whatever at the open meeting. Um, just so that the public, you know, doesn't get cut out of the discussion. We don't want them to um, not know or understand um, what's being talked about. Um, so a site visit is excluded or exempt from the open meeting law. So when you go on a site visit, you are um, not supposed to discuss uh, the substance of the case. You're just supposed to um, become aware of what the site looks like, where things are in relation to one another. You can ask questions like, oh, what is that behind the barn? Or um, can we walk around the parking lot and how many parking spaces are there? But you can't start to um, deliberate or discuss anything about the project at a, at a um, site visit. And the public is excluded from a site visit, and that's a specific um, exemption that's in state law. So any, any things that you find out on a site visit, um, you bring up at the public meeting or the public hearing, and so the public can be made aware of what your, um, what your findings were at the site visit. Is there anything else to be said about that? Uh, you know, I think one thing to add is, is that you, in the spirit of making sure that any deliberation that you as a board member have on this, uh, on a specific topic, it, you, you want to make sure that you're not having conversations with the public about a specific um, application or, or an item before the board. So if you're at, a, at somebody's house, they come up to you and say, I'm really upset about X, Y, and Z. What, what are you guys doing? You have to really you have to be able to say to people, I really can't discuss that. That's something that's going to be before the board. I think that's, uh, that is another item, aspect of this that you don't want to be. be so you can ask uh, people or suggest that people come to the public meeting, yeah. make their concerns or questions known. You can ask them or suggest that they submit um, something in writing and then everybody can see it, but you're not supposed to talk to people like if you meet them at the town um, transfer station or something, you're not supposed to talk to them about a case that's before the board. You can talk to them about something that's before the planning board or the conservation commission, but not yeah. something that's before the zoning board of appeals. Yeah. 
A prior member said this in an in a administrative meeting once, and I, I thought it was good advice. Uh, you know, uh, this member was saying occasionally, you know, his friends will say, you know, X, Y, and Z either against a project or X, Y, and Z for the project. And he would always say, don't, I can't talk to you about it. I can talk to you about sports or, you know, whatever, but I can't talk to you the case. And if you do talk to me about it, then I'm going to recuse myself from the project. And so in essence, those are your options of, of if you need to talk about it, then you should recuse yourself from, from that case um, because uh, outside of the meeting, um, members should not be discussing any applications uh, with other members or members of, of the public. I see uh, discuss uh, things John and, go ahead, Chris. I was Sorry. just gonna say you can discuss things with staff. So but anytime staff, you have yeah, a question staff. or a concern or something, you can call the staff because we're disinterested people who are just here to provide you with information and we don't have any role in making the decision. Okay. Joan and, and Dylan have their hands up. Oh, um, sure. Go ahead, Joan. Hi, um, just to reiterate on the recusals, we have the right to recuse ourselves and also that we are required if we are 300 feet as in a butter to recuse ourselves. That happened to me this year. So I just want to remind everybody of that fact. Yeah, Is that's that a very answer? good point. Um, let me, oh, I don't have it up. Um, so in the handouts I gave you, one of the pages was um, the disclosure form for conflict of interest. And I'll try to pull it up right now. And so, as Joan had just said, yeah, so um, say if you work for the applicant, you're an employee of the applicant, um, there would be a financial conflict of interest. Say if your dad is the owner of the applicant, it, or the, like there's a, fa a close, there's a family member, your family member is the applicant, um, things of that nature. Now, whether you are within 300 feet of, of the project site, um, sometimes that's a gray area. Um, we've, um, we've been flexible with that. We've asked if sometimes members will say, oh, I feel impartial. I do live within 300 feet of that property, but I don't have any opinion. And I feel that I could um, make a decision and not have an impartial opinion. In that case, you would want to, again, file disclosure form and announce that at the beginning of the meeting. So an example would be, um, yeah, so um, I don't need an example for that, but um, so you would want to fill out the disclosure form and submit that to the town clerk. Um, sometimes you would be a butter, um, uh, maybe a direct a butter, uh, or you know, again, just within 300 feet. But you do feel that you would have a partial um, bias. That would be a, a good move to recuse yourself. Um, and, and if you're at the meeting, you would say, I recuse myself, and then you, um, you would just move your seat during that public, public, um, public hearing. Another well, example- Before, we go, to, before yeah. we go to Dylan, I, one of the things that you, you, should, you need to do is to take the conflict of interest course that the state provides, and you have to fill out that you've, that's a requirement of, of your service on the ZBA is to, uh, to do to do that conflict of interest training that goes through a lot of these issues, um, and I think that's important. That's a good way to learn because this conflict of interest is is complicated, and there's so first off do that, and secondly, if you have a question, town staff can really help, but also the state has the state ethics commission has a, a hotline you can call, and they can give you a quick answer or they can give you a written answer, and so you have. You have three ways of trying to learn about this. One is a training, one is a town staff, and one is a state. So, and I wanted to say that my advice to abutters or people within 300 feet is always to recuse yourself because if the case is appealed, 
that would be um, a possible grounds for appeal. And you want to make sure that whatever you do, um, you know, you have the tightest decision, the tightest process, and, you know, without error. And, you know, sometimes it, it happens that you have to invoke what they call the rule of necessity, which is if you can't have, if you don't have a quorum and can't hear something and it's going to be granted by constructive grant, then you can invoke the rule of necessity. And that has some implications and some process which, which I have not ever gone through. So in that case, it would be possible to sit on a case if you did have an interest in it. But in general, it's better to recuse yourself if you're in a butter or if you even think that you have um, reason to you know, have a conflict. Dylan. That's a good point. You ha you've had your hand up for quite a while there, virtually had your hand up. Yeah, I wanted to go back, um, ask a question about when we were talking about site visits and, and deliberations. You can't do deliberation on site visit. And maybe this would be just become clear as I, as I serve on the, on the ZBA, what the distinction is. Because if I were at a site visit and say, you know, we have the plan, we reviewed the plan, and we're actually on site seeing something, and it raised, say, a lot of questions for me that I wanted to ask there on site. Um, what ends up being the distinction of really trying to you know, ask questions based on the, the information you receive when you're actually viewing a site, kind of what counts as deliberation, which you can't do on a site visit? You might be able to um, divulge what your questions are, but I don't think anybody would have the ability to answer you. Um, and then you would have to bring up all those questions in the public hearing. So. It's, it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis, and it's a little bit of a gray area, but I just always advise people you know, not to discuss the project unless they're asking something specific like, how wide is the driveway, or how many parking spaces do you have, or you know, something like that. How many feet is yeah. it between your driveway and the intersection? Those kinds of, of hard physical facts you can ask questions about, but anything having to do with uses or whether something is good or bad, um, you really should avoid. Yeah, and sh you should uh, wait until the public hearing to ask those questions. Um, alternatively, or additionally, uh, you can always feel free to email staff your questions if you feel that you would actually, you know, you think that knowing that answer before the public hearing could be very vital uh, for the board to consider mm -hmm. and uh, certainly uh, give us a phone call or send us an email um, and we can um, help address the, um, your question. I have one thing about site visits is that we always, I didn't mention this on the, uh, the agenda, but one thing we do with every application is we re report on our site visit and that includes uh, what we actually did. We observed the, the property, we walked the the fence line, whatever it is, and we also list the questions that we asked. And so we go to a great length to make sure that there's no um, information provided at the site visit that's not shared with the public. Mm -hmm. So can I just say, yes, Keith. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in terms yep. of site visit, uh, two things. One, uh, we're not to discuss, the, the, it, it is a chance for the applicant to present to us. Um, some minor questions can get asked and Steve will tell them and us that whatever is asked there has to be asked at the uh, meeting, uh, at the uh, hearing. Uh, the other thing is, Steve, again, just in terms of procedure for practicality, would you just talk about how you open the uh, site visit and what a normal sure. and kind of consists of. Sure. What we typically do is we wait for everybody, wait for everybody that's going to come to come. All those ZBA members, the applicant, and the town staff. And then when we open the, open the site visit, we say, this is an opportunity. Uh, we introduce everybody. So this is an opportunity for you to describe the project to us. We're, we are not, um, this is not an opportunity for you to sell this on us, to us or to make, make your case. This is your opportunity to describe it. We're gonna ask limited questions. Any question that we ask, or we're gonna re have to repeat at the board, at the hearing itself in two days. And, um, and so in that regard, we just wanna have the, the, um, 
just the facts, ma'am. Sort of the, the, the you, you're not old enough to remember this, but Joe Friday was just the facts, ma'am. And that's really kind of what, we, what we're looking at here is just give us the basic facts. We'll make the decisions later and we'll ask those questions of the application of the applicant at the public hearing. So we go a long ways to try to, we understand the, the issue that you have, Dylan, or that you're raising, the question you're raising. And I think we found a way to deal with it satisfactorily to most, to most members. Okay, and one other thing is that before we go on a site visit, we have the plans, we mm -hmm. have the proposal, and we, you have the, the chance to uh, really familiarize yourself with that. So that when we go on a site visit, it's to literally physically see what you're talking about two dimensionally on those papers. Exactly. Joan has her, her hand up. Um, just a clarification on when we do recuse ourselves, if and when that occurs, we still have the right as a community person to speak at a public meeting, correct? Yes, as a public yes. member. Correct. Yeah, and so for that, for that, um, and we don't identify ourselves as a ZBA member at that moment. No. Well, you could say, oh, I am a ZBA yeah. member, but I'm speaking as a private citizen. Okay, thank you. And you would do that when, um, as Steve went through uh, his, his opening statement is that you know the applicant presents uh the board member most likely has questions for the applicant there's a discussion going back and forth and then at some point the chair will say are there any members of the public that would like to make a comment about this application and then that so then you as the resident would come up to or come up to the virtual podium and make your comment. And so you would state your name and your address, and then you'd make your comments or questions. Tammy, has, a, uh, Tammy has her hand up, I see. Sure. I was just gonna say that during the site visits, Maureen is there, and often I will quietly go aside and ask Maureen a question, um, because I have, you know, I'm a newer member as well, and so I do have a lot of questions, and occasionally I have asked, um, at the time, Mark, you know, is this an appropriate question for me to ask before I said anything out loud um, to the applicant? Um, and then the other thing, uh, the other comment I want to make is that I, all, I often call uh, Rob or Maureen and ask lots of detailed questions because I don't, sometimes I don't know the parameters of what we're talking about, like, you know, um, whatever it is. Uh, I, you know, just so I can get a general understanding of exactly what we're talking about. Both of them are really helpful and always willing to talk to me. And I do have a lot of questions. And then on the disclosure front, um, it, it's, it is a little confusing for me on the disclosure front because I know so many people in town. I worked at UMass and my son played soccer and I know every other person in Amherst. And so often I know the petitioners and, um, and just have to make a statement uh, beforehand. But I have, I have had a case where I actually had a conflict with somebody and so then I did the written disclosure. And so, uh, you know, I think it's, it's important to figure out exactly where you are on those things. And again, talking to uh, Rob and Maureen is really helpful. Yeah, yeah that's a really good point. Um, you know, it is a small town. Uh, one example comes to mind that, you know, there's only maybe one or two fitness gyms. And, you know, if the fitness gym is the applicant and there's members that, you know, are, uh, they're actually, they're members to that gym, you know, they have to make that disclosure. And uh, that's just like one example of, it's a small town, you know, people go to the movie theater, there's Amher Cinema um people go to antonio's do they know the owner it's all these um potential like you know you're learning this new thing conflict of interest is it a conflict you know a lot of people and so rob and chris and myself will help guide you through making that decision whether there is a true conflict or not and then the 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 safest way to determine that for yourself is to call the state and talk to them about it and they will give you a ruling on that um, to help um, guide your decision on that. Um, one other thing about the site visit, uh, well, two things, uh, you know, I try to work with everyone's schedules for that. Um, so it, um, 
like Joan, for instance, traditionally, I think you have Tuesdays off. So I've, um, I've tried to cater to Joan's schedule and um, with Tuesdays in general, um, sometimes people have told me they only could do it at lunchtime. So I'll try to cater it from 12 to one. So if I, as I get to know all the new members, I hope to, um, you know, if possible to help cater to your needs. Um, sometimes I can't cater to everyone's uh, schedule. So in those scenarios, I'll have to say, well, unfortunately you're gonna have to do the site visit by yourself which means that you would have to go and just, you know, walk around the property or maybe do a drive by if it's very obvious from the street um, or um, you could do that or I could accompany you on the site visit. Also during the site visit, I try to take photographs um, of the project site. Um, and sometimes that does come in handy at the meeting um, just to refer back to um, of, um, as a refresher from the site visit. So during this COVID-19 time, we also wear masks during the site visits. Yes. So Maureen provides you with masks. I, I would just add, like I just add one thing and then I think we should probably move on from the conflict of interest. It, you know, there's, a lot of, there's, there's two really important reasons to be diligent about this conflict of interest. The first is it's just the right thing to do. It's a state law. You don't want to have a conflict of interest. You want to be a dispassionate disinterested, um, not yeah, dispassionate and disinterested uh, panelist. That's true. The second reason is pragmatic. If you, if you should have recused yourself, if there was a conflict of interest, it causes, it, it is grounds for appeal and a grounds for overturning the actions of the body. And so there's really two reasons there. One, you, it's the right thing to do. Two, it, it can end up um, it, uh, avoiding all the work of the, of the, of the board. And so that's really important. It's you know for also for your members, uh, the fellow members of the ZBA. You don't want to have to go through all this work and have it appealed because there was a conflict. So I think I think that's the, the 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 last we really need to be saying about this. Except the staff is great, the state staff is great, and take the training session. It'll kind of open your eyes as to what is a conflict and what is, the state considers a conflict and what it doesn't. So that's I think that's probably enough on conflict of interest. Yeah. Um, oh, wrong one. Uh, so good segue about trainings. Um, I have to find the website. Uh, who is it? It's, it's planner training for, for Massachusetts. I forget what the acronym stands for. Citizen planner training collaborative. There you go. So, um, they were actually supposed to provide their annual training back in March, and that obviously got canceled. Um, so they are a great use resource for uh, planning boards, ZBAs, maybe uh, and maybe other boards and commissions. Um, they provide uh, various trainings throughout the year, and they have an annual conference. They are now going to the virtual world uh, slowly. So they will be offering online training. Um, we actually just found out the other day that they were offering a, a training tonight at seven, um, but we already scheduled R1, R1. So I'm hoping that that one will become um, available online at a later date. But anyways, I was going to say is uh, whenever a training that we feel is appropriate for ZBA members will, of course, uh, forward you that information and encourage uh, all members and but specifically new members to attend either uh, virtually or once, once we reach the other side of this in person and the town has enough funds to um, hopefully to um, to pay for the um, uh, registra registration fees. So um, the town uh, definitely encourages the ZBA members um, to attend. Um, yeah, so um, what, what else? Um, hmm. That is, that is the ZBA in the net, in the nutshell. The ZBA, uh, actually, Chris, could you describe what the planning board does as a contrast? Yeah, so the planning board has a little bit wider um, range of responsibilities. 
The planning board uh, works on the master plan for the town. And the last time we did a master plan was we had one adopted in 2010. So now we're working on a master plan update. Um, the planning board also um, works on the zoning bylaw and proposes um, amendments to the zoning bylaw. And the method for doing that is changing since we've changed our form of government to town council. So we're trying to work out exactly what the new um, method is, but the planning board is very much involved in, in writing the zoning bylaw. The planning board also um, reviews and approves subdivision uh, applications. So if someone owns a big tract of land and they wanna subdivide it into individual lots and build roadways um, and put in infrastructure, the planning board would review that. Um, and the planning board has a number of um, permits that it also reviews. One is um, a site plan review, which is very similar to a special permit. It's modeled on the special permit, but site plan review is considered for something that is con it's considered to be um, in the right place in the zone that it's being proposed. So um, in the list that Maureen mentioned, the use categories, section 3.3 of the zoning bylaw, we list all kinds of uses. And um, some of them are allowed by what they say SPR, site plan review. And what that means is the use is allowed in that location, but the planning board can tell the applicant um, how, to, uh, how to design the site. I mean, the applicant comes with a site plan, but the planning board can put conditions on it, like you need more trees here, or you need a fence there, or you need to rearrange your parking, or you need more parking, or something like that. But they can't say no to the use. The planning board also reviews some special permits, and usually they are either dimensional special permits, um, so that if the planning board is reviewing a site plan review application, but the applicant also needs um, to modify his side setback requirement, then the planning board could um, consider that special permit that's associated with the site plan review. And then there are also some specific special permits which are listed as SPP in the table of use categories. And those are things that are specifically allowed for the planning board to review. And then the planning board also um, has a couple of other things. The one that comes to mind is um, scenic roads reviews. So there are a number of scenic roads that were designated in Amherst back in 1974. And they were designated because they're so beautiful and typical of New England. And often it's because they have uh, wonderful trees or stone walls associated with them. So when someone wants to um, remove a tree or a stone wall or rearrange a stone wall, on a scenic road, then um, the applicant needs to come to the planning board for permission to do that. Um, the planning board also reviews plans that people propose for subdividing their lots that are not part of a subdivision. So if, some, if a farmer owns a property and um, all of a sudden he needs some money to buy a new tractor, he might decide, oh, I'm gonna carve off what we call a frontage lot, which is a lot that has frontage on a road and I'm gonna sell it so someone can build a house there. So as long as the lot has the appropriate amount of frontage and lot area, then the planning board um, endorses the plan. That's different from approving. In fact, ANR is the designated application and ANR stands for approval not required, but you still have to get the planning board to endorse the plan, sign off on it that it is not part of a subdivision and that it meets the frontage and lot area requirements. And I can't, oh, I know, another thing. <laughs> I'm gonna bore you all to tears, but the planning board also reviews um, what we call chapter um, 61, 61A and 61B uh, release requests. So someone who owns, um, say, a piece of land that's used for forestry or farming or recreation, those have different uh, designations under chapter 61 in the Mass General Law and um, they get certain tax benefits as a result. So if they wanna remove part of their property from uh, that designation, the town has a right of first refusal for the property. So the planning board and the conservation commission have to uh, make a recommendation to the town council as to whether the town should acquire that property. And generally speaking, they um, determine that the town shouldn't acquire the property because the town would have to pay 
fair market value or an appraised value, which, you know, often it isn't worth it for the town to own, you know, some small piece of property for $100,000. But um, that is another thing that the planning board does. They make recommendations on whether um, we should uh, exercise our right of first refusal on chapter, chapter lands. Well, that's what they call them, chapter lands. So I think that's all that the planning board does. And so all the um, applica applications that the ZBA review, the public hearings, um, I give you um, the list of the applications and you will um, inform the planning board of those uh, special permit applications. And, and sometimes the planning board will want to actually um, hear from the applicant to provide recommendations to the ZBA. Yes, and they did that on the University Drive South project, which went before the ZBA. So the planning board is really just reviewing the site plan or possibly reviewing the exterior of the building and then making recommendations to the ZBA about what the planning board thinks the ZBA should do. But then the ZBA is perfectly within its right to either take those suggestions or not take those suggestions. It's just yeah. another set of eyes on the uh, on the project. Yeah, and traditionally those are, the planning board will provide recommendations for, um, you know, larger projects. They wouldn't necessarily do it for like a, a proposed duplex or something like that. Um, but it's really up to their discretion what they would like to provide recommendations to. Yep. And so the ZBA really, their roles and responsibility is, is to review the application before them and to see whether the sections that they are requesting uh, for the use or dimensional requirements and then the 10.38, uh, it is your responsibility to see whether they meet those requirements under the zoning bylaw. And so your role really isn't in, uh, isn't to say, you know, let's just pretend there's an Italian restaurant coming in and you don't like Italian. Mm -hmm. That's not a reason to deny an application of there's too much Italian food around here, or I don't like Italian food. It's really to refer to the zoning bylaw um, and see if that application meets the requirements under the zoning bylaw. And generally the ZBA tries to figure out a way of allowing things to happen um, and coming up with conditions that will um, mitigate some of the impacts. So their general um, demeanor in public hearings is to try to work with the applicant to figure out, well, how, how can we make this happen? But then in the end, if you feel like you absolutely can't put conditions on something that makes it acceptable, you can deny it. And you, you actually don't even need to state your reasons for denial, although we recommend that you do because that'll help the, uh, if it is appealed, it will help during the appeal. Yeah, yeah. And just to echo what you're saying, so you would want to make conditions that would limit or prohibit any adverse impacts to the neighborhood or, you know, the scenic views or the watershed or, or whatever is specified in 10.38, you would refer to those findings. Um, and so that helps protect the town, the health of the health and safety and character of the town. One other thing I should mention is that if a case does get appealed, the town um, will uh, back you. In other words, you're not out there on your own having to hire your own lawyer. We have a lawyer who's very good and um, you know, he will um, you know, protect all the ZBA members um, when, when something, you know, when there's a lawsuit that's filed. Uh, does anyone have questions, or comments? You did a really good job, Maureen. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Steve, Steve as well. Steve as and, well. And great <laughs> questions from everyone. Um, so all ZBA member, uh, ZBA meetings are always recorded. When they're physically at town hall, they're record, recorded with an audio recording. Here, we're actually kind of lucky, in my opinion, because uh, we get the recording of the audio and the video. Um, this will be posted on YouTube by our IT probably in the next couple of days. Um, so I can um, send you a link 
uh, if that's helpful. Uh, and yeah, if you feel, uh, I'm sure. So as every, uh, all existing ZBA members can attest to, there is a learning curve. This, uh, you will, uh, this will take time to absorb all this information, to feel comfortable asking questions at meetings, perhaps. You'll uh, probably have questions for staff, all perfectly acceptable, um, very normal. It definitely will take time to uh, get a handle of being a board member. So, you know, uh, Chris, Steve, and I, um, are always there for you to answer any questions. Uh, and yeah, we're excited to have you here. And then one other final note. So the full members are uh, always expected to come to the regularly scheduled meetings. And those are listed on that uh, sheet. Uh, it's like a deadline sheet I provided. For the event that a board member uh, can attend, they're on vacation, they're sick, there's a conflict of interest. Um, that member needs to inform me about that. And so then I can then turn to one of our associates. And so, um, so then I will ask around who's available um, and I will get someone to panel that public hearing. You either for one specific public hearing or for the whole evening. Um, and then I will rotate every time that happens. So um, um, the alternates shouldn't expect to attend every single meeting as a member. However, especially as you're new on the board, it'd be helpful but not required to attend as just a member of the public to listen in um, and hear about the cases and watch the process. And again, luckily with this virtual, uh, platform. You could either do it live or watch the meeting later at your leisure. So, um, so there's some options. Yeah, I'd just like to, to um, reinforce what Maureen said. It's, it, we're we're going to try to cycle through every, all the associate members when there's a, a, ch a chance that uh, one of, when there's a time that one of us can't make, the regular members can't make the meeting or have a, has a conflict. We want to give everybody an opportunity to do that. But I really do want to encourage you to go to, to some of these meetings, to go to every, meetings at the beginning all the time and try to get a feel for the, the, um, how the, the meeting works and how the hearing is conducted. Now that you can do it in your pajamas, it's really a, a good way to do it, I think, is <laughs> virtually. Um, and you can learn a lot. And it's the only way you're going to become familiar with it because the, the zoning bylaws are really daunting. You'll want to take, you'll want to be, you want to get familiar with it it's going to take some time but the best way for me was to listen to the deliberation of the board and see the cases and now that we can do it virtually through zoom it is an easy way to to come up to speed on on the, the issues uh, that we have to deal with in the zba so i'd encourage you to to participate virtually in the hearings on on every other thursday night uh, even if you're not sitting on the panel Does anybody have any questions? If not, I think that's great. If not, we have to end this meeting and then go to the public hearing. So I would, um, absent any other questions, I would move to close our public meeting and we would then go to public comment. No, excuse me, we have to go to public comment then we have to close the meeting. So we're done with the business for the day, for the ZBA. We can open it up to public comment at this point but I don't see that there's any attendees on the list, Maureen. No, I don't aren't. think there's anybody, any public member to comment. If there is, uh, this would be the time to do it. But since there's not, we will, um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I, I guess I will say that absent any um, uh, objection, we will adjourn this meeting until uh, the 20, the next meeting's on the 21st. Is that right? Yes. Okay, until the 21st. All right, thank you all. Any objection? Thank you. Thank you. We have heard. a motion and a second. I have a second. Yes, second. Oh, a second. Well, we can, all in favor, then we'll do it this way. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right, we've done it. Thank, thank you very you. much, all. See you in two weeks.
Good night. Erin,